our main need here in the community is housing and so um, you know, we really need to make a difference and even four houses, five houses a year isn't going to make it um, a big enough impact for what we need, you know, and so that's why I say um, we're kind of gearing up for the future now with these prefabricated panels, you know, doing the cast in place houses um, or the hempcrete building on site houses. You can only do so many a year in Minnesota, whereas with these prefabricated panels, we can have you know, upwards of 50 to 100 houses ready to go um, and then just pop them all up. That's Danny DeJarlay, Hempcrete builder from the Lower Sioux Indian community in Morton, Minnesota. This is the Lancaster Farming Industrial Hemp Podcast. Hello there. Hi, I'm your host, Eric Harlock. And today I'll be talking to Danny. We're going to find out what's been going on out there on the reservation this summer. Uh, they're about to open up their processing center, and they are hosting a field day on September 7th. So we've got a lot to talk about today. Plus, I will be checking in with the folks from the Hemp Feed Coalition to hear about the AFCO vote this week. Did hemp seed meal get approval for laying hens? Well, stick around and find out. First, a few words from our sponsors. Today's show is brought to you with generous support from IND Hemp in Fort Benton, Montana, where they believe in the goodness of hemp. IND Hemp is a family-owned, mission-driven industrial hemp food, feed, and fiber company that's bringing new opportunities to farmers in Montana and the American West. Check them out at indhemp.com. Today's show is also brought to you with support from Forever Green, distributors of the KP4 Hemp Cutter. Introducing a revolution in hemp harvesting, setting a new standard for harvesting quality, speed, and efficiency. The KP4 prepares hemp for ideal redding and easy on-field tedding, raking, and baling. Easy to maintain and design to withstand the punishments of hemp harvesting. The KP4 Hemp Cutter is available only at hempcutter.com. Hey everybody, welcome back. So here we are, it's the first week of August, more or less. First full week of August, I guess. Today is August 8th, which is a Thursday. I normally put the show out on Wednesdays, uh, but this has been a strange week for me, mostly because I got COVID. So I lost a day earlier in the week, so everything got pushed back a day. So thank you for your understanding. If I sound weird, It's because I have COVID, but don't worry, I'm not contagious over the podcast, so you can continue to enjoy our show without fear of infection. Anyway, we've got one big nugget of hemp news this week, and that news is coming to us out of San Antonio, Texas, where just yesterday, Wednesday, August 7th, the American Association of Feed Control Officials had their annual meeting, and one of the things on their agenda was to vote on the definition of hemp seed meal for laying hens. And moments after the meeting ended, I spoke to Morgan Tweet and Andrew Bish from the Hemp Feed Coalition, uh, who were in attendance at the meeting. Hello, Morgan Tweet, Andrew Bish, uh, you've got some good news for us. We do. It's good to see you, Eric. Um, We're here in San Antonio at the annual meeting for AFCO. And we just got out of the general session where um, there was a vote on the tentative definition for hemp seed meal for laying hens. And Andrew, give them the results. Yeah, the motion carried. Yeah. Uh, uh, Unanimously, was there any... uh, uh... We had, uh, with two two abstentions, uh, it passed. uh, There were no nays. That's awesome. Yeah, we were prepared for, you know, to, to talk or defend or anything. And it was actually very anticlimactic. So okay. uh, it passed really quickly. And um, we've actually been able to connect and network this week. And everyone um, obviously is in favor of it. So. Yeah. Well, you two um, have been working very hard on this for years and years with with your teams. Um, so what happens now? Like, what does this mean for the hemp industry? What does it mean for industrial hemp? What does it mean for 
poultry. I don't know. Tell me what 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 this means. Um, yeah, from a, a very like tactical measure or um, approach, it's open to states that uh, will acknowledge a tentative definition. So um, processors can start um, soliciting feed mills and others to start using hemp seed meal as a laying hen ingredient. Um, so that's pretty exciting because a lot of times we've had a hard time selling those co-products. Um, so obviously it's an economic game and we're going to have to work on pricing and volume and all of that. But we haven't even been able to be at the table yet to have those conversations. So now we do. And um, I know from our standpoint um, at IND Hemp, we've already had people reaching out to us as soon as they heard the vote was pending. Um, and they're looking for alternative protein products. And so um, especially other oil seeds. So this is really exciting. I think this is very critical to, to you know, the line in the sand that now we can start doing business. Yeah, I think as, as you're aware from my perspective, Eric, this is a tremendous opportunity for farmers. Uh, th this is the first real pull on the hemp market. Uh, it will be the first real large pull. Uh, and that represents rotational crop opportunities for producers. And, and that, that's what I'm all about is, is finding those opportunities. And, and this now is a real opportunity for those producers. Yeah. So what happens next um, with Hemp Feed Coalition? Do you start on the next ingredient definition or do you start amending this one? Uh, it's a good question. We'll definitely take it back to the board. You know, we've been continuing to work in the background on several fronts. And so I think we do need to just kind of regroup. This was obviously something we've all been extremely focused on. And um, so just regroup and take a look at the list of tasks ahead and prioritize um, amending the definition to potentially increase levels of um, cannabinoids is, is on that list for us to consider. But other species and other ingredients are also there. So we've been doing a lot of work on ruminants. Um, broilers as well. So I think that we'll see those two um, ingredient applications um, in the future. So Yeah, I think that when you look at what we've done here with, with egg laying chickens, uh, we, we've kind of worked towards one end. And now that we've accomplished this, we can do multiple things simultaneously. But we really wanted to get this through the gates uh, before we spent our time on uh, a lot of other efforts. So just because we're going to be putting forward additional applications doesn't mean uh, we can't simultaneously amend uh, what we're doing here with the egg layers. Yeah, cool. Well, thank you for all the work that you've been doing on this for years and years. This is huge for the industry. It's huge for farmers, huge for everybody. So, yeah, thank you. Yeah, and, you know, I think another testament is, um, you know, AFCO, obviously, we're just a single ingredient. There's a lot of other things that have to go through. We're just a drop in the bucket. And just to get the response from a lot of the investigators and even the ingredient definition chair who has worked through this, you know, since we submitted our application in 2021, they recognize that this is a big step and um, are really excited and celebrating with us um, that this is a really key milestone. So I think we should take note of that from folks that are not in the hemp industry, that they're also celebrating with us because they understand the magnitude. So, yeah. And I, I want to thank uh, you, Eric and Lancaster Farming for continuing to shine a light on this subject and uh, giving giving us a forum to, to talk about this important opportunity. Well, yeah, you're welcome. I mean, we're here for the farmers and this is, this is great for agriculture. So yeah, happy to be part of this. Um, so it's barely 10 o'clock in San Antonio, Texas, right? You had your vote this morning. You're going to go celebrate. Is it too early to celebrate? <laughs> well, it depends on what celebrating uh, you consider celebrating, but we are we are definitely celebrating uh, already. So uh, in a in a very non non inebriated fashion. There you uh, go. Okay. This is called sober celebration here. Uh, but we've done we've done a few happy dances. Um, I don't dance at all, so the fact that we did a happy dance is, is that's 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 pretty pretty intense for me. <laughs> <laughs> the only other thing I, I'd like to add, I guess, is. I just really want to thank everybody that supported our efforts. You know, we had so many, so many people um, support us over the years uh, financially. Uh, we we have a number of board members that have participated in this. Uh, obviously, Morgan and I are, are often the face of this, um, but but that but that's it. There's so many people behind the scenes doing some great work. Uh, and, and thank thank you to all the supporters of the Hemp Feed Coalition. Yes. Cool. Well, thank you for joining me on such short notice. And again, this is this is very exciting and uh, happy to share the news with our audience. Yeah. Thanks, Eric. Really appreciate it. Thank you.
All right, there you go. There's the great big hemp news nugget. AFCO voted yes on hemp seed meal for laying hens. So obviously this is great news. Um, We've been following this story on the podcast for years and years now. So it's great to see actual progress being made. I know some folks weren't super happy about the uh, cannabinoid limits in there, but you know, you got to start somewhere and check it out. They did. So, all right, moving on to our main interview today, we're going to talk to Danny Dejarle. You know him. He's from the Lower Sioux Indian community in Morton, Minnesota, where they are developing one of the most ambitious hempcrete housing projects in the country. Danny Dejarle from the Lower Sioux Indian community in Minnesota. Welcome back to the show. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Thanks for having me. So I guess I haven't seen you since you were here in Pennsylvania back in, I don't know, April or May for one of Cameron's building workshops. So I thought we'd uh, catch up a little bit. What's happening out there in Minnesota these days? Yeah. So uh, since we've been out there, I guess what we've done in Minnesota is we've done a complete retrofit of a house, of an existing house that was here in the community. Um, We've also been finishing up the building of our um, hemp processing facility. And so we've been super busy, I guess. We don't have as many houses to show this year or, you know, um, last year we did four houses. And so this year it's, uh, you know, we're only going to have the one house at the end of the year, but we have a lot, um, I guess a lot going on as well too. So for the future, we're going to be, we're going to be ready to crank out the houses once we get, um, the panels going, you know, in the winter and everything. So cool. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So your production facility, is that like a full processing facility? Yeah. So, um, it doesn't do like the full line. We don't have a fiber line. Um, we don't have a, um, like a grain line or anything. We are only going for the herd right now. And so it's basically a pretty small line um, of equipment. We do plan on expanding in the future and using other parts of the plant. But right now we're just going for building grade herd and trying to build some houses using hemp creek. Yeah. Cool. You said a minute ago that like, oh, this year you only have one hemp house done, but that's more hemp houses than most people in the world have done this year. So still a pretty cool thing to have. Yeah. Yeah. And it it is a cool thing to have. Um, but our main need here in the community is housing. And so, um, you know, we really need to make a difference and even four houses, five houses a year, isn't going to make it um, a big enough impact for what we need, you know? And so that's why I say, um, we're kind of gearing up for the future now with these prefabricated panels, you know, doing the cast in place houses, um, or the hempcrete building on site houses. You can only do so many a year in Minnesota. Whereas with these prefabricated panels, we can have, you know, upwards of 50 to a hundred houses ready to go. Um, and then just pop them all up, you know? And so it's, we want to do like actual housing developments out of all hempcrete you know we don't want to be doing just you know a few houses a year we need to make a bigger difference so well tell me about the community and like the housing crisis um are there lots of people who are you know housing unstable i guess yeah and so it's not like we have people just wandering around homeless or anything or wandering around on the streets it's more of an overcrowding issue a lot of different generations in one household you know you'll have the the mom the uh, the mom and dad the kids the grandma the grandpa aunts uncles you know you'll even have cousins you know and so it's i think our last census said that we were in need of 200 houses in our small community which only has um, roughly 160 houses in the community right now on the reservation Um, there's more of more houses off of the reservation that are um, members live in but actually here on the reservation we only have somewhere of around 160 and we need 200 more and so there's a big need here and if we can only do four or five per year that's not going to cut it you know it's going to take us 50 years to do that and then we're going to need another two to three hundred houses by then so you know we need to make a bigger difference i guess is what we're trying to do yeah are you looking into like multi-unit multi-story kind of hempcrete houses is that even a thing we can do here yet 
Yeah, and so um, well, the first house we did was a multi-unit. It was the duplex, and so I think we should do more of that because we don't have the land mass that we would need to even put up 200 more houses. You know, these houses are going to have to be duplexes, fourplexes. You know, uh, yeah, I've even mentioned doing a small apartment building out of Hempcrete, but then you also have to factor in, then you have to have people to maintain these buildings as well, you know, and that comes as a cost, and so... Um, we're thinking probably on the smaller scale, maybe start off with some more duplexes, maybe work our way up to a fourplex and, and see how that goes. Um, but yeah, we don't have the land mass. And so we're going to have to either stack these houses um, real close to each other, or we're going to have to yeah, do some duplex duplexes and multi-unit. Okay. Um, and then you talked about the, the panels. So you're making what the big, are they eight by four or what, what's the dimensions of these panels? So we haven't, um, you know, the only panels we've used so far are just the ones from Matt Marino at Homeland Hempcrete and um, the panels that he used on our project um, were that size, four foot by eight foot. But we wanted to even experiment with um, maybe some houses where there it's just four panels. You know, it's basically like a box that comes on a trailer ready to pop up. You put the four panels together. That's your four walls. You get a roof on and, you know, onto the next. And I think that's the way we'd really be able to just um, pop Crack these out fast, you yeah. know, and yeah. um, a, lot, a lot quicker assembly time as well, you know. So with the four by eight panels, when we did a 520 square foot house, that was it came in 22 panels, you know, if we could shorten that down to four or eight panels or something, you know, it would speed that up a little bit as well. Um, but yeah, just something along those lines, you know, we don't want to get into the giant panels like they're using out in Newburyport either, because then you're right. going to need, you know, huge cranes, cranes and, and everything. You know, we're thinking something still that our um, payloaders and stuff can move around, you know, and we don't need huge houses either, you know. Um, we're just thinking some smaller units, um, just some ro some roofs over our, over the heads. Right. So yeah, you went up to the Hillside Center for Sustainable Living with Cameron back when you were back east a few months ago. What did you think about that? Did you were you was there inspiring takeaways from that, or what what did you learn, or or I don't know. What yeah, are your thoughts that was, on that. That that place is amazing, you know. Um, I recommend everybody go take a look at it or at least look it up online because yeah, everything out there, not just that it's made out of hempcrete. Um, they just have a lot going on there, you know, with the solar um, parking garages, all of the, the, the roofs were all solar. They have um, permeable pavement. There's edible landscaping, you know, it's just a really cool, you know, the name um, center for sustainable living is a, uh, is a good name for it. So yeah, it was very inspirational and, um, you know, we don't need um, big fancy units like that here, you know, but something like that, you know, where it could be apartment buildings out of um, just the panel system and just really um, done quickly, you know, and efficiently. And I think that's just the way we really make a difference, you know, in, in Minnesota anyway, is the panels. You know, I know people in warmer climates, they might really like the cast in place or the spraying um on site or whatever you know but in minnesota we just don't have enough time to really do do a lot of houses that way um, we would need a, you know 15 more crews if we were going to do something like that and actually make a difference right now is that because of the weather like summer starts uh at the beginning of june and ends at the end of august and the rest is yeah that's exactly right you know and so we've tried to um and then even in that window you know if you have um, you know, we've tried to control the in entire build, um, but if you're doing that many units, you're going to have to sub something out, you know, and then you're going to be at the mercy of those subcontractors of how fast they're going to put your foundations down or how fast they're going to get rough in your plumbing or your electrical or whatever it is. And so, um, yeah, I think it's just, it's going to be um, a bit of a challenge to to do that if you're doing casts in place. Um, and even with this prefab, you know, it's... Uh, it's going to be harder, but um, it it's still going to be hard, but not as hard, I guess, you know, because if we can just get the foundations laid and everything in the in the warm months. The rest of the months, we can still be putting up these panels. You know, we did the panel house with Matt in January last year, you know, and so as long as you get all of the groundwork done um, 
before the ground's frozen, you can do all of the rest of the hempcrete work if it's if it's already cured, you know, like you wouldn't be able to cast in place that late in the year or do spray when it's, you know, 40 below outside, you know, so, and you wouldn't even want to be out there doing panels, but you could, You you know, could, you yeah. could, because it's already cured. And so I think just the short building season is the main reason, um, but then the speed as well, you know, because even if we had warm, warm weather, 12, 12 months out of the year, you know, you still have to, um, you know, cast all of those um, houses and then you'd have to wait for them to cure Mm. and then you'd have to come back and, and finish them. Whereas if you can get all of this stuff cured in a, in a facility, I know you still have to account for that time as well, but if you can, you know, just keep, keep doing the panels and keep making them and have them on stock ready to go, um, you know, like get ahead of yourself, Yeah, I guess. yeah. Um, whereas you you can't really do that if you're building on site, you know, On site. you can't get ahead of yourself because you, you have to have the clients there. They have to have everything. Whereas you can already have these panels built and in storage ready to go. So when your client is ready to build or you have your foundations ready, you can just pop these houses Yeah, up, you know, that's so, cool. it, you know, you still have to account for that time and labor getting put in, obviously, because somebody has to make the panels. Um, but then it's just the being able to, do it at such a fast rate when it's time to build, you know? So that's, and it's not, it's probably not everybody's um, best way to do it. You know, I'm not saying this is what I, what, what everybody should do. This is just what we plan on doing, you know? Right, So. right, right. Um, so you, you mentioned the need for more housing. Um, what what do you need to make that happen? Like you need more people, more money, more time, better weather. Definitely, definitely more money. So it always comes down to the funding, you know, and, um, You know, we probably could have done a few more houses this year, um, but we don't have the funding either, you know, and so all of our projects have really came through grant funding or some type of funding that's going to be lined up. Um, and we really don't have much of that in the community. You know, there's they won't give you like a traditional house loan here on the, on the reservation. And so the loans that the banks will offer you are usually for a prefabricated house that comes out on a trailer. and um, can leave on a trailer in case, um, you know, there's ever any problem with the bank or anything, they can just come and take your house. Take your house. Yeah. Yes, and so they won't give you a traditional house loan, and so we can't just go to the bank and say, hey, we need a house. Um, they only give you basically that option to do, um, like, the trailer home or the modular home that comes out on two trailers, you know, and they piece them together. Um, you know, they don't even allow you to have it on a basement for the most part because they want to be able to just come and haul it away. And so, yeah, the funding is is where we're kind of the choke point, you know, and we have the need for the housing, but the the people that need the housing, they don't have the funding for it, you know. And I'm sure that's everywhere. That's every community. It's probably not just ours. That's, um, you know, nobody can afford a house right now, especially a brand new one. So talking about the the banks, uh, forgive me for this, but it reminds me of a, a joke. Um, Mm -hmm. you know, you give a man a gun, he can rob a bank. You give a man a bank and he can rob us all. Mm -hmm. Is Mm that -hmm. a joke or is that not a joke? Yeah. That's just a, a proverb. I don't know. Anyway, um, you're doing some things now to bring like more, I don't know, more attention to, to the work you're doing there. Um, I know you've been talking to the folks at Patagonia. They're doing some sort of Yeah. movie. You're also having a field day next month. Um, and so I imagine you're getting lots of attention um, from places that you never even expected it. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so um, I think we got to give you a little credit. You're the first one to do any type of coverage or any story for us. Well, that's thanks to Earl, because I met Earl at NOCO Yeah. a couple of years ago. Yeah, so that's good. You know, you were the one to first get it started. But yeah, we've gotten tons of attention um, and it's great. You know, like we love um, all of the um, support, you know, we're not we're not in it for attention or any Right. of that stuff, I guess, you know, um, But the main